Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 147 of Real Blend, a podcast that would trade producer Gabe for a PlayStation 5 right about now. On this week's show, we finally get to catch up with Disney's crazy new slate announcement. Naturally, all of that news broke the minute that we posted our latest episode. So we're going to circle back around and talk about all the fun things that Disney revealed is coming. We are going to review uh, Chadwick Boseman's final performance in the Netflix film Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And Paul Greengrass joins the show uh, to discuss his new film with Tom Hanks called News of the World. My name is Sean O'Connell. I am the managing editor here at Cinema Blend, and I am joined, as always, by Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago. Hello, Jake, how are you? Hello, my friend. I, I've decided that our, this is a deep cut, that our podcast is the podcast equivalent of Good Luck Chuck. You remember that Dane Cook movie back in the day where he would sleep <laughs> with a woman and it would then, like, that then one. that woman would then turn around and like instantly get married. So women would want to sleep with him because it would mean that they would go on to find their true love. Oh, I gotcha. If we record an episode, yeah. it means tomorrow there will be breaking news it means five minutes after we're done recording there will be breaking we are the podcast equivalent of good luck chuck it's also literally like people who listen to the show on a regular basis are poking fun at us on the facebook page that's driven yeah. they were like of course this news breaks yeah. right and, and we don't always record on the same day so you can no. make the argument well why don't you guys record we've recorded mondays and then there's news on tuesday we've <laughs> yeah, yeah. recorded thursday yep. and there's news on friday it doesn't matter when nope. we record doesn't matter at all um the other person joining the show as always kevin mccarthy fox 5 hi kev sean, in washington dc fox 5 in washington dc sorry i cut you off thank you no sean gabe jake good to see you good to Kevin's see you. that other voice uh, that you might occasionally hear punch in throughout the show is producer gabe hi gabe wait who is that well n- new people who are joining the show late don't know who gabe is which is kind of like on brand <laughs> like I like the fact he, he's that like really... um he's like the neighbor in Home Improvement, just kind of on the other side of the fence. We can yeah. really only see a little bit of his face. Wrapping us up, he's silently yeah. wrapping us up. Uh, housekeeping: If you're watching us on YouTube, hello, nice to see you. A lot of people tuned into our Patty Jenkins interview uh, for Wonder Woman 1984. Hopefully, you guys have hit the subscribe button and you are going to tune back in on a weekly basis to the YouTube pitch. If you're listening to us where you get your audio podcast needs served, there is more information in the description or the show notes of how you can sign up for our YouTube channel. We are really close to a thousand YouTube subscribers and you know me with my OCD. Uh, this is something that bothers me a lot. I would like to get to a uh, thousand or cross over it maybe by the end of the year. How about that? I'm going to throw that out as a goal. thousand subscribers on YouTube, on the YouTube channel by the end of where the year. Where are we at right now? Uh, 880 something. So that's feasible. Come on, that's doable. Jake, throw some of your thousands upon thousands of YouTube subscribers over to us. Post something on the Instagram. Um, the, just, dude, just, just like Instagram. a story. It's cleaner. Can't you do a story? <laughs> dude, I'm, try- I'm trying to get a, to 100,000 <laughs> on, uh, on YouTube so I can get my little silver button. That's uh, my goal. Yeah. That's my, but, that's my very specific goal. You know who we should have back on the show? Chris Van Vliet. He would put us over the top. God, no joke. <laughs> that dude, that dude's got it. Is there a wrestling tie-in coming up somewhere that we can We either pull need in? to know wrestling or have six-pack abs. Uh, this is really <laughs> odd, too. I know, I know either. Looking at the, um, this is really inside baseball, but uh, there's a traffic story on Cinema Blend right now that is blowing up. It's going through the roof. It's about um, Jake Paul calling out some ufc fighter and the ufc fighter shared it shared our story on their twitter account <laughs> and well, wow, okay uh, this, this may be an ignorant question how is that a cinema blend story uh well uh it's just more because... the blend part <laughs> 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 yeah less cinema more blend well we have a tv section and those fights get aired on television so we cover sports a lot yeah i know Anyway, we had a TV section and it is on TV sometimes. It's it's but we do we do pop culture stories. It's pop culture related. Entertaining to see Jake Paul get pummeled by actually he's a pretty good fighter. He's been doing <laughs> yeah. pretty well. All right, listen. Anyway, we're off the rails. Weekly poll. Uh we did a weekly poll and usually it's themed after um relevant stories, but sometimes we like to just detour into uh randomness. And so we asked last week, do you mix your chocolate snacks and your popcorn? Mainly because I think that that's really horrifying when people do that. Um, oh, Gabe, what's the matter? You seem surprised. You seem surprised. Just continue. Sorry, I, uh, I didn't mean to react so honestly. Kev, I'll g- I'll give you the three options. Okay. Do you mix chocolate snacks in your popcorn? The options were every time, sometimes, and gross, never. 
Which Gross one do you think never is a bad is a bad answer. Why? Because like I don't do it, but I don't think it's gross. Well, then you would say sometimes. No, because I don't do it. Oh, you're too picky. I'm just so... gross and gross and never are two completely different answers. Do you know the weekly but you poll would, is? But you would go to that answer if you only had the three. You would just go sure, with never. But it's... the weekly you poll to... is is something that any of the hosts can do week after week. Yeah. <laughs> and, it... <laughs> and, and and really, I, I forgot the Twitter password. <laughs> if you have an issue. So anyway, Kev, which one do you think won? Well, I mean, one of the things I find interesting about that poll is, like, I do mix them, but not the way you would think I do. So, for example, Ooh. if I get if I get a large popcorn, I'll also get a Goober's, which is a, a candy with, like, chocolate and peanuts. Um, my dad and I used to get them when I was a kid, so I kind of, like, continue getting them. So what I'll do is I'll purposely shove a whole thing of popcorn in my mouth and then shove the Goober's in my mouth and <laughs> chew them at the same time. Okay, that's the correct way to do it. Right, but I don't pour the chocolate on top of it because I don't want it to all fall to the bottom. But I do like the two together. So I don't know where I would fall in this poll if I do it independently of each other. So is it, would I be a would Independently I be a yes? is fine. Sure, independently okay. is fine. I think I did necessarily mean putting the chocolate into the popcorn, but That's you in I your mouth... It. But in if, your if, mouth, but, but, you're if mixing them. but if they're both going to your mouth at the same time, what's the difference? So he there's a bit, there's a big difference. Uh, <laughs> and the, is is the consistency? So it's the same. So I, I I was thinking about this the other day. Think about when you get a plate, right? And let's say the plate has steak, asparagus, mashed potatoes, sure. which is like a, a meal that Jake and I lo- lo- love a lot. If you put all that in a blender and 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 it's, it's an exotic and, and, meal and, and and spun it all up and drank it or, or ate it that way, it would it, it would be a different taste or consistency. Than, than it would I don't know do you know what I mean like, yeah, I feel like that's different I, I, I feel It'd like what we're talking about is if I get a piece of steak on my fork a little bit of mashed potatoes and then put it in my mouth together versus okay. getting a piece of steak in my mouth and then a little bit of mashed potatoes and chewing at the same so time you, that's, so, you're, that's, so, so you're saying what you would do with the steak and mashed potatoes is what I'm doing with the, the, the popcorn and chocolate. no I get I get I cut a little piece of steak and then and I get a little bit of, little, little bit of, yeah, little bit of mashed potatoes thing. on it and then put it in my mouth Right, so it's just the the idea. The problem we is we wanted pop- this show to be short, no, and it is no, not going to be short today. In all honesty, no. This is a very this is this is a very interesting conundrum. I love because this when, I love when it. I love when you say conundrum. Well, when you're on when you're in a theater, it's not possible to see where your chocolate popcorn okay. ratio is in the dark. Sure. So that's why I do it. So that's independently. why. But it has nothing to, to do up, with like right. texture or taste or anything. It's not I like that Kevin the, knew yeah. that the chocolate will fall to the bottom of the bag because that's a man speaking from experience. Dude, like, it's... It, <laughs> yeah, there's no... So, all right, so to go back to your question after my long explanation, um, I would argue that our audience... Give me the three one more time. Sometimes, always, every time, and gross, Every time, never. sometimes, and gross, never. I'm going to say... I'm going to say our audience went more with sometimes... They actually went with gross never fifty seven percent. But see, Why? I don't think it. I don't think it's fifty seven percent people saying gross. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a large well, number did. of people just saying that they don't do it. No, they That's why did. It's a flawed poll, man. They said gross never. By the way, I can, we, just, can yeah. we explain how underrated goobers are? I feel like they're like a, kind of a lot, the lost candy in the in the movie theater candy uh, aspect of things. Like milk duds kind of fall into that category What's too. What's in the middle of a the, goober? Goober is the raisin one. It's no, a peanut. No. It's oh, a raisinets peanut, are the raisin one. Raisinets. And then, like, I feel like the go-to candies everyone says, like, you know, again, I love Sour Patch Kids, you know, uh, Skittles. I just feel like Goobers doesn't get the respect it deserves. What are I the ones think, that yeah. are yeah. chocolate-coated but, like, super chewy? Um, milk Duds. Are they Milk Duds? Milk Duds yeah. are yeah. my jam. I, I love that we chose this poll to, I like, do something great. less serious, and we've yeah. had a more intense debate over this poll than any poll we've done. Yeah. Like, like a poll over the changing of the industry of which we love so oh, much. Yeah. Solid 45 seconds. So here, <laughs> chocolate and, and popcorn, four minutes. So here's the new thing that Lauren and I do. And this is this is actually born out of a movie theater. Um, and so Regal uh, started doing Cheetos popcorn, like Cheetos flavored popcorn. Oh, OK. Ooh, all right. And yep. so what, what Lauren and I will do is we'll make we'll make a popcorn uh, uh, like a, a microwave popcorn or whatever. And then we'll take uh, jalapeno Cheetos. Mm. Oh. And then just pour them on top, but shake them into the into the popcorn so that every pickup has a couple of Cheetos in it. Oh. That's so that would be similar to the chocolate thing. Because how home, are you tall and thin? That makes no <laughs> sense to me. Because I've like, seen because I've seen Tenet six times, and I and I can't stop. Like my mind is always racing, so I have a high metabolism. By the way, Tenet 
t- we're recording on Tenant Day, by the way. Today is Tenant or, or, Day. Or, or oh, today day, is? Depending on, on how you think of it. Tenant Day. Everybody can see Tenant now. Oh, and uh, this is a, a very important PSA, and, I know, and then we're going to move on. Uh, I've checked the digital version of Tenant. Um, anybody out there who's watching Tenant, watch it on a hard disk. Um, please get the hard disk, the Blu-ray or the 4K. Um, I got a Blu-ray, and I put the digital code into Vudu. The Vudu does not have the aspect ratio IMAX shifts. So if you want to see Tenet the way Nolan shot it, you might have to just get the hard disk. I know people out there are like, I don't buy discs anymore, but if you want to watch the film the way it's intended, I don't think, I mean, Damien Chazelle told us he's trying to watch Dunkirk on iTunes, yeah. and it didn't have the, the, the ratio shift. So if you're seeing Tenet for the first time, do it at a hard disk. Okay. Kev, we have established over the years that you and my son Brendan are um, very similar. So I need to oh, ask you are. something about your eating habits um, before we move on from the poll. Uh, <laughs> Brendan doesn't like our, his food to touch. Are you a person who doesn't like your food to touch? It's a, It depends. I mean, but you're talking to somebody who hates tomatoes, cucumbers, celery, onions, Brussels sprouts, uh, zucchini, squash. Right. I hate all that stuff. So if any of those things touch my food items in a salad or on my plate, it ruins it. A tomato okay. on a burger removed, burger's done. Ruined. Okay. Because ruined. It's like specifically he uses multiple utensils because he wouldn't want to eat like mac and cheese with a spoon and use that okay. same spoon to eat another piece of food. I would say it's a little extreme, yeah. but I will also agree with you that I think Brendan and I are very similar in the sense that we like like the certain things, so I wouldn't judge him on that. I just That's feel fair. like you, you have your own way of doing it. I yeah. don't do that, but right. uh, but Brendan, you know, more power to you, brother. I think it's extreme, and we cater to it, and that's a problem. <laughs> So That's... you're doing multiple dishes. Oh, like you're yeah. washing. Oh, so many dishes. <laughs> so we run the dishwasher once a day. I've, you know, I appreciate that he has conviction, you know, about that stuff at that age. You know what? You might as well. Yeah. If, you, if, you, if you feel a certain way, Jake, 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 he's... Jake, Jake's in my same boat. Jake and I are very picky eaters, and we just are, we have, you have to be confident in your yeah. pickiness. I, I just got to say, I've never understood other people's fascination with how other people eat or what right. they eat. Like, oh, yeah. especially, like, honestly, and, I, and you guys, are, I love Chicago, but the whole, like, no ketchup on your hot dog or your your pizza has to be of this thick like who cares oh, I love who cares what other people dog. eat eat let eat what you want to eat i don't yeah. have to eat it you eat it right. i mean you're wrong about whataburger but other than that i agree with you speaking of whataburger uh paul greengrass joined the show this week <laughs> i don't know i had no way to transition uh this is one of those we're recording it before it actually happens but we have paul greengrass on the calendar um to discuss his fantastic new film news of the world starring tom hanks and so a hashtag if it happened without further ado we hope the real blend podcast interview with uh paul greengrass on behalf of news of the world hi paul it's sean o'connell from cinema blend and the real blend podcast how are you sir i'm very good very nice to see you nice to see you also i love this film i am so Um, moved by it and blown away by it and just so impressed by everything you accomplished um when i whenever i watch a, a western authentic period western like this the the ones that have the ability to really transfer an audience back to a, a, another time i can't help but think to myself this shoot had to be loaded with all sorts of headaches just to bring them <laughs> to reality well, can you tell me well, a few things um that are really difficult about pulling off a western that you probably didn't think about until you were in it well you've got we had the whole lot on this film, you know, a, a child actor, horses, cattle, dust, extreme heat, extreme cold. Right. Uh, uh, very challenging locations that we had to be roped up to two hours at a time, roped on because of safety. Rattlesnakes, a lot of rattlesnakes. No way. I would have left. <laughs> yeah. Spiders, <laughs> biting spiders. Uh, you know, wagon crashes. It, we had everything. And uh, safety issues, of course, but, you know, doing a horse chase and a wagon chase. Here's the thing. The easiest thing, if you'd asked, if I, you know, if I'd given you that list and you'd have said to me, what are you thinking at the outset of it was going to be the most difficult? I would have said that the most difficult is to find the young girl to play Johanna. I thought mm-hmm. that was going to take months. I thought we were going to have to see hundreds of young girls. It turned out to be the easiest decision of the entire film because 
Gail Mutrix, one of the, uh, literally about a week after we'd started looking, Gail Mutrix, Mutrix who's one of the producers, uh, phoned me up and said, oh, have you seen System Crasher yet, which had just won Berlin? I said, no, I, I'd love to see it. She said, oh, I've got a copy. I'll send it to you. I watched it that night. Have you seen that movie? I have not, no. Oh, absolutely brilliant. It won the Berlin last year. Uh, she's amazing in it. Okay. And I looked and I thought, well, it obviously has to be her because right. how many 11-year-old girls that good are there in Germany? I know it had to be a German actress, you know. Right. Um, and she came over a few days later and we auditioned and she, I gave her the part there and then. So it turned out to be the absolute easiest decision. The rest <laughs> of them, the horses, the cattle, the rattlesnakes, they were... <laughs> Uh, you know, the climbing up to locations two hours every morning, every evening on ropes. That we just had to do. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting. When you make a film that's extremely arduous and physically demanding, as that one was, weirdly, we all got into it. It became like a whole adventure, you know, and we were sort of all bound together. And I think... I think everybody really loved making that movie because it was a, well, because it was an adventure. And I think that shows in the film, incidentally. Well, it helps that you and your leading men are, are just voracious students of history. Um, and, yeah. and if you don't get the period details correct, you're both going to be disappointed in yourselves. Yeah, exactly. I'm, exactly. I'm curious about uh, working with Tom again a second time, something that you learned about him uh, on the Captain Phillips collaboration that you thought you were able to really capitalize on uh, in this film. Well, I didn't know he could ride a horse so well. I don't <laughs> think he knew he could ride a horse so well. Uh, I didn't know he could handle, uh, you know, period firearms as well as he did. Really? Yeah. I, did. I mean, you know, you, that's the great thing when you work with people a second time. You know, you, I mean, I, I, you know, we'd obviously got to know each other well, but this is a very different film. He'd never made a Western. I'd never made a Western. And right. And, you know, it was a challenging physical ordeal for him. And he was amazing. I mean, he just, whatever you threw at him, he, he was game for it. Uh, and it's hard, you know, being in the saddle, getting off and on the horse, galloping, you know, you know, racing around, you know, the rocks and, and the height. And, you know, it's, it's, big, it's big stuff. And he was... Fantastic. And then, of course, beyond that, there's the Tom Hanks, the fantastic actor, the brilliant sure. movie star, the, the decency, the, the brilliant instincts, the, the hard work, the thoughtfulness, the intelligence. Uh, and I think that, well, honestly and truly, I think it's easy to take Tom Hanks for granted a little bit because his standards are so high. The move, you know, his performances are always so good. Right. And he seems to have been turning them in now for year after year for many decades. And he has been, you know, but, you know, you're talking about one of the greatest actors, one of the greatest movie stars of all time. He's right. Up there with, Jimmy Stewart and, and Henry Fonda. Right. You know, he's a great, great uh, uh, explorer of the best of what it is to be the best of us, you know, to try and surmount your doubts, your fears, your difficulties, and still remain decent. And, and I honestly think this is one of his greatest performances I do because it's really about this this lonely newsreader who wanders from small community to small community with his satchel of newspapers reading in old barns at night or in dusty town squares it's the healing power of storytelling he's he's weaving a tiny thread in a broken world in the shadow of the civil war trying to draw people together through the healing power of storytelling. And, and then he meets this little girl in the woods and 
reluctantly he sees that he's the only one who can take her home. Right, or right. Thinks it's her home. And the journey becomes the journey towards healing, the journey towards a better place for both of them. And they both have to face up to, you know, the grief of the past to move forward to a better place. And that's why I made the film, because I'm a parent and our world is very difficult, I think. Whatever, I'm not making a political point here, whatever our politics are, I think we'd all agree the world feels, you know, divided, too bitter, you know, uh, stuck. You know what I mean? We can't move forward, lacking in unity. What's the road forward here? What's the road to healing? Well, compassion. Compassion, I think. I think that's what the movie radiates. Compassion. And Tom Hanks does that. He shows you that it's not going to be leaders that are going to fix this thing. It's going to be ordinary people who are going to find their way out of this division and bitterness. And that's what kid and this little girl and what their journey is all about. And I love that at this time, Christmas, uh, you know, this movie that's about the journey towards hope is going to come out. I think it's wonderful that Universal are going to put it out in theatres, albeit for all the difficulties, because we need the healing power of stories right now. Right. You know, our, we are the storytelling animal. We tell stories to our children. We tell stories to our parents. We tell stories in the home, in the bars, in the cafes, in the street corners, in our cinemas, in our theatres. We, it, it, it's the collective healing power of storytelling. It's what, it's what experience expresses our humanity. And right now, because of COVID, our ability to tell our stories to each other, whether in the home or in a cinema, is very, very limited. And we all feel it. And also it's limited because storytelling itself is under attack. Right. As is in the film, you know, because people want us to substitute lies for truth and truth for lies. And he... He faces that in the film and he has to face it down. And it's part of his journey to get to the final scene, which is redemp- it's a redemption story. But at that moment, he is at one with his audience and with the little girl. Everyone is healed, if you can put it that way. You know? And I love that about the film. Um, I want to get to Darius's work and, and, and cinematography, and I would like to get to your editing approach, but I want to just backtrack just a second for something you brought up about taking Tom Hanks for granted. Um, is that what, in your opinion, did that cost him uh, a nomination for Captain Phillips? Because to me, that was one of the I most so. singular. I thought so. I thought he was utterly brilliant in that film. Uh, incredible power, incredible uh you know, incredible humanity. Um, uh, and I didn't think he got the recognition that he deserved. And, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully people will see this, you know, because I think this is a, it's amongst his very finest work. I really believe it. Absolutely. We debate your, the, the biggest, not that, you know, Oscars matter, but the biggest snubs to me from your work would be Tom's performance in Captain Phillips. Yeah. And then something I didn't realize until just recently, United 93 not getting a Best Picture nominee, a nomination, yeah. when to me it's probably the greatest film released that decade. That decade. And I'm glad you got in the director conversation, but it astounds me that it didn't make it into Best Picture. Well, never mind. These look, <laughs> you don't make films for awards. They're nice if they come and, and you know, I've, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's Tom, that it's your actors and, and the people that you've worked with. I mean, you know, I know you want to talk with Darius. You know, when you make a film, you are, you all, it's the, here's the thing. It's the central experience you have as the filmmaker, as the director, is that you are the jack of all trades, but the master of none, Mm -hmm. surrounded by the masters of their craft. So when you're standing 10 feet from Tom Hanks in a scene, you know, the hairs go up on the back of your neck. Uh, uh, you know, it's, I can't tell you what it's like. I'll tell you what it's like. It's like 
standing right next to one of the great violinists of the world or, you know, you know a, 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 a master painter, you know, an, a true artist. You're looking at an artist in supreme command of their craft and you've right. got the privilege of being right up close and personal to it. And it's the same when you look at your cinematographer. You know, mm. Derek Wolski is one of the great cinematographers. I mean, he's shot so many big movies, you know, a lot of Ridley's great movies, right. but other, other movies too. And I wanted to work with Darius, but I've wanted him to work for him a long time, but I thought this would be great for us both because I'd never shot a Western and I wanted to make a film that felt different, but still authentic to me. It's, it had to feel like one of mine, but feel different. You know, you, right. you make films, you've got to break new ground. You've got to challenge yourself. And mm -hmm. I wanted to do that with this. And I thought that Darius would help me. Well, first of all, we got on like a house on fire. <laughs> but, but but he did. He had that sense of scale and grandeur, and we we would push and pull each other to do things so that it ended up with this intimacy and intensity that I like, and uh, and a feeling that you're really there. But it also had a classical movie uh, identity that I loved as well. Well, one element too that I found different was um, your editing approach. And obviously the work that you did on the Bourne franchise kind of plunged people into uh, the action sequences. You have one of the most suspenseful, elongated sequences as a shootout on a cliffside. And I I thought you took such a different approach from what you normally do. Could you just talk about how your editing uh, informed your storytelling this time around? Well, I wanted, as I say, to slow the tempo down a little bit. Um, you can't always make the same film. You have to challenge yourself. That's, sure. the, key. That's the key to, to staying in the game. And, uh, but, you know, I'm very lucky to have Billy Goldenberg editing with me and, and he's a maestro. And, you know, he, he knows, he knew that I wanted to, this film to feel a bit different. Still be me, still feel authentic to me. And, you know, he knows that I love to craft action sequences that start as one thing, move to another, then to another, then to another, you know, so you get this elongation and the fact that you live in it. Uh, but I didn't want it to feel fast cut and frenetic you know i wanted it to have a deliberate build a classical build mm -hmm. but still have you held on the seat uh, you know on the edge of your chair and i thought billy achieved that whilst also nailing all those intimate characterful moments you know and and also this because action there's no point to an action sequence unless it has a profound truth about character that lies behind it that you find through action. And in that sequence, what you find at the end of it is that these two characters, the old, you know, the, the lonely newsreader and the young girl, have learned to trust each other through going through the experience of that chase and shootout. And that mm -hmm. makes the action sequence earn its place. You know, you feel like you've got to the next stage in their journey as characters. I was fascinated by the concept um, that news for the people at that time was treated almost as a distraction from their day to day. Yes. Uh, and it's and, and almost had a, uh, an entertainment aspect to it, a performance almost of the, the newsreader himself. Mm -hmm. I think news nowadays is quite the opposite of that. It's so uh, we're, we're so immersed in it that it that it isn't a distraction. It is our day to day. So what is your I would love to know your opinions on. Uh, contemporary journalism, modern journalism, and, and how they might have informed how you, how you approach the way the storyteller operated? Well, I, look, I think that there are lots of colors to kids' news reading. You know, mm -hmm. first of all, as a wandering news reader, he's rooted in his community. They're his people. He understands those communities. You know, the roots of these traveling news readers would have been the traveling preachers. You know, right, right. Uh, 
you know, the roots of Methodism were the traveling preachers who traveled in, in you know, what was then England. And then, of course, when they, they came to, to, the, you know, to the States, uh, the same thing. You know, they were the people who, who brought the good news, uh, you know, and, and with the good news came the news. And so you had this sort of, and of course, uh, you know, a traveling preacher who could perform would draw a larger crowd. And, you know, but, but then you, you go on to the, you know, after the Civil War, it's a landscape full of dislocation, lost people, broken people. Right. And people are wondering, you know, he makes his choice. His kid has lost his printing press. He can't, as he says in the film, he can't print the news. He couldn't print the news. He'd lost everything. He couldn't print the news, but he could still read it. So that's what he did. Mm-hmm. But really, what he's actually doing is, He's engaging in the healing power of storytelling. He knows that's what he does. When the very first scene, he says, good evening, Wichita Falls, you know, pleased to be with you again, you know, and I'm going to tell you some stories. And for an hour, we're going to hear about the great changes that are happening out there and you can escape your lives for that hour. But the news is also challenging. It's, some of it's necessary news. You know, he, he starts with news of a meningitis epidemic. When we, when we shot that scene last year, it didn't have the resonance that it has today. Sure. You know, later he talks about the federal news. That's deeply unpalatable to his audience. It challenges his audience. And he, he is, uh, you know, abused for telling them those stories because they don't want to know about those changes. Sure, know? sure. Well, but kid... Kid responds because he understands their fears. He understands their anger. You know, he doesn't, he, he tries to persuade them. You know, it's the, he's trying to heal. He's trying to, without being preachy, he wants to tell the news and he wants people to hear him, you know. I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And that I'll goes on, you know, all the way to the redemption story at the end, you know. But well, I'm all absolutely things have colors of today, I think. I'm absolutely going to pair this with uh, Tom Hanks as Ben Bradley, legendary Ben Bradley in the post. Because... <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. But he, but, but the interesting thing is, Tom is very, very, very interested in obviously the spoken word and the written word. You know, he collects typewriters and he's a great student. And I could feel when he put that black frock coat on, he was standing in a tradition that, you know, went from the, from the traveling preachers through Mark Twain, you know, and onwards. And by the way, also informs the movies too. You know, this is a world, the world of, of, of news of the world is a world before television, before radio, before movies, before social media. But you know, movies had their had their birth in hard lives. You know, people went to the great movie palaces because they were warm and bright and places that would transport them from from hardship for an hour or two. Right. So there's something about this film now at Christmas. I'm very proud that Universal are putting it out in the cinemas. It's not a good time to put a film in the cinema, as we know, but we have to stay true to what we believe in. We believe movies will come back, and we can't, we can't just say that. We have to try, this is Universal's, and I, I agree with them, we have to release it. Okay, it won't be the best time to release it, but it's a statement of faith. It's a statement of intent. It's a statement of belief that movies will come back and they will, that in six months time will be better. And there's no better film for these times, I think, than the story of the lonely newsreader with the healing power of storytelling, searching for a way out of division to a better place. I totally agree. I am so honored to speak with you, sir. I love the film. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Uh, Obviously, we want to thank Universal Pictures for giving us time with Paul Greengrass. News of the World is coming only to theaters uh, starting on Christmas Day. And honestly, 
it's one of those shows as you uh, one of those movies as you can tell from our conversation that that demands being seen on the big screen the cinematography is absolutely phenomenal um, sean i would say that that paul greengrass is an un like an incredible like like his name is synonymous with incredible quality yeah not nearly as popular as he should be uh but always consistent and never gonna let you down much like the burgers of waterburger see then my transition made sense there you go. And that's Thank why you. Nolan is in and out. <laughs> yeah, pissing and a lot of people off lately. <laughs> <laughs> all right, come on. We can't go down that road. We're going to get, get too lost in burger talk uh, and our favorite filmmakers. And when we have plenty of stuff to get to, starting with the Disney announcements and the slew of content that's coming to Disney Plus, uh, it was kind of one of those. It, it was unusual that somebody uh, took a, a clip of a recent show of ours where I had said in conversation with you guys, hey, I think it's time for Disney to potentially do a DC fandom type event where they just uh, lay out everything that's going to be coming from all the properties that they own, be it Marvel, be it Star Wars, be it uh, Pixar, the home entertainment section, the live action side. And that's essentially what they did. They turned the Disney investors call into their Hall H or D23 type panel and laid out everything that's going to be coming to theaters and coming to home entertainment. One of the, the big takeaways was that they're not going all in the way that Warner Brothers did uh, in the controversial way of saying everything is HBO Max and uh, limited theaters day and date. When Kevin Feige got to something like um, Black Widow, he still said, we're looking forward to bringing it to theaters. We'll see you in May. Uh, movies like Shang-Chi and The Eternals are still going to be going there. Star Wars doesn't have anything on the docket uh, immediately that would have to worry about going to theaters. But the announcement that Patty Jenkins was uh, going to be doing the Rogue Squadron movie. Uh, of course, she announces that the day after she comes on the Real Mind podcast. That was the ultimate slap in the face of news breaking right after we do something really cool. Because uh, she said today or uh, in a story that was making the rounds today that she's really far into the... Um, the template for what her story is. So clearly she's been on the docket doing this Rogue Squadron for a long time. Can we give um, Patty credit for that brilliant video that she put out that she directed? Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to say, like, anybody out there who hasn't seen it, it is, it's an incredible video. It's a very vulnerable video from the perspective of somebody who's sharing something very personal to her. Uh, and obviously you think about... I, I say vulnerable because you think about somebody putting their their personal life out there, talking about her grandfather, right? Her grandfather was uh, was, was her, or grandfather her father, or father? Her father. Yeah, I think her father. It was her father. It was her father. It was her father. And like you think about like how personal that is to her to to put that out there and then to transition her passion into the world of a film of Star Wars that comes from that's born out of the incredible patriotism of, of something like what her father did. So I, I just think it's a really, it was really cool to see her talk about it in that way. It just, it just made me feel more personable towards her and towards the project. It actually made me care about the project more um, that she was so like out there about, about her life and her family. So to me, that made it more uh, immersive and, emo and emotional. So, and her walking toward the X-Wing is just, I got chills. It's insane. Like, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, so I am now convinced, and if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be disappointed that I want Chris Pine to follow her uh, over and do Star Wars to become an X-Wing pilot because... Did you did you ask him about it? Uh, no, because I was running out of time and I really wanted to talk to him yeah. about Spider-Verse. Um, it was going really fast. I would have just asked if he... Yeah. But you know, if I ask Chris Pine, like, do you want to go to Star Wars? Be like, well, I'd be honored if Patty would, you know, he'd give me that answer. So he'd That's be in Star Wars and clickbait. Star Trek? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he's done Marvel in DC, so why not? Yeah. Yeah. Be fantastic. You know who else is in Star Wars and Star Trek? Simon Pegg. But this he had to like hide himself this underneath the aesthetics, yeah. basically. Yeah. But I, I just think Chris Pine would be ideal as a uh, because he does he, in in my interview with him for Wonder Woman 1984, he basically admitted that he patterns all of his uh, heroes after Harrison Ford, the reluctant sort of uh, you know vulnerable human type of hero antihero that that Ford right. loves to play. He could bring that blast of charisma to the Star Wars universe. So um, I, I would love to see it happen. It seems so obvious um, that they probably won't end up doing it. But uh, let's get back around to the announcements. Kev, of all the things that got revealed, whether it be Star Wars or uh, any of the Marvel projects or Chris Evans doing a Buzz Lightyear movie or any of that stuff, what stood out to you from from the Disney announcements that you're most chomping at the bit to see? Weirdly enough, it's the Chris Evans Buzz Lightyear thing. And I'll tell you why, because I think the concept of, of of a movie about Buzz Lightyear as a human prior to the the toy character that we got, um, 
And again, it's one of those situations where we're dipping back into the well. We're going back to something that we've already seen. I just found that to be that that piece of news. I mean, all the Star Wars stuff, obviously, was it was a huge deal. But I, I for me, it just there's just so many Star Wars things <laughs> yeah, that I don't even know what to be excited <laughs> about. And like, you know, I don't know about you guys, but Star Wars is such an interesting thing. I, I know it's more, more personal to Jake, but. You know, after Rise of Skywalker and the discourse, I was, you know, I was just getting tired of Star Wars. Uh, and then Mandalorian pops out with one of the most insane se- seasons of television I've seen just from a production scale. Are you caught like, up? Uh, I'm, I, I have to finish the the one we discussed uh, last week, but um, the, the, la- the last Friday. You, you, yeah, you would, yeah, you, you yeah. would. So I've seen, yeah. I saw Filoni's, I saw Rodriguez's. I, I think okay, Dave, cool. I think Filoni's. Uh, episode the Jedi with uh, Ahsoka is probably my favorite episode in the whole season so far. Um, but anyways, so back to what we were saying that that's kind of why Star Wars isn't the route I'm going with this answer. It's more of like there's just been so much. The Buzz Lightyear one just kind of fascinates me. I'm actually interested to know. I I actually think that's a really cool concept. I'd yeah. love to know who that guy was pr- prior it, to becoming Buzz Lightyear. So for me, it, it made me rethink about there. Woody has a line in the first film where he's talking to Buzz and he says something along the lines of like, wait. Do you think you're the real Buzz Lightyear? Yeah. And I never really thought about what that line meant. Mm-hmm. I thought he just meant like like you think you're the character that you were, you know. But now it there's a there's another layer to it because it implies that there was a real Buzz Lightyear and they made toys based on him. It would yeah. be like if if you had like a you know a Buzz Aldrin toy yep. that came to life. Or an so evil it's Knievel, all, so it, like a big time yeah, evil Knievel. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm curious though how that works. So the Buzz Lightyear character that he's playing is, is the, is the human being that the he's human, playing. Yeah, the, the human His name that exists. Is Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, he he's exists like a, in the Toy Story like universe. Okay, that's it's that, isn't that, that's, that's my understanding. Isn't how Pete Doctor explained it in the in the uh, on the actual video was. They always they always pictured Buzz Lightyear's toy to be based on a really cool movie, and this is that really cool movie. Oh, oh, so that's like, interesting. So I it, think that that's so an what actor I remember. who plays Buzz Lightyear. Maybe that's him. I think so. Yeah. What the yeah. hell? That's what I gathered. Is that they always explain this to a six year old? <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, sorry. the simplistic way to explain it really is it's a movie about the person Buzz Lightyear is based on, and I sure. think. But yeah. but then then you get into the weeds of okay, is it a, is it a person who's playing Buzz yeah. Lightyear? Then that person. You got you got four yeah. grown men right here who can't yeah. figure it out. So. But, in all honesty, that was that to me was like that was the most like what the hell kind of head scratch moment. I was like, that sounds kind of cool. Like I'm interested yeah. in seeing that. And plus, I'm all I'm all Pixar'd up right now, literally on um, because of Soul. And we had Pete, we have Pete Doctor coming on our show uh, mm-hmm. for Soul as well. So we're you know I, I think uh, I'm just in a Pixar mood. I watched uh, uh, Wally yesterday again. Nice. I love that movie. So uh, Jake, yeah. I'm going to defer to you for Star Wars. Uh, they have 10 projects coming, things like uh, Ahsoka Tano getting her, her <laughs> spinoff show, uh, the return of Hayden Christensen. What direction are you going in terms of, well, first off, I, I'm going to ask you this question, kind of knowing the answer. Did it, does it feel like too much at this point? Uh, I'm going to say no, because I feel like if the movies have taught us anything over the last five years, it's that if we're, now that we're branching away from just that core Skywalker saga, mm. not only are there way more other stories in this galaxy to be told, they also like, you know, George Lucas based this on like serials that he watched mm. growing up as a kid. So to me, it's only like poetic that we're going back to, which is why I, I even kind of give Mandalorian a pass for basically kind of being a mission of the week because Mandalorian is the exact kind of show that inspired George Lucas in the first place. So maybe Star Wars is, granted, I will be super jacked every time a new movie comes out, but maybe Star Wars is a a type of story that needs to be told in sort of a weekly basis over long forms with those weekly cliffhangers and Mm -hmm. stay tuned, reader, next week, this and this and this, or you know? So, you know, I am slowly kind of really digging this new mode in which we are getting Star Wars stories. Not just new Star Wars stories, but a new way to ingest them. Um, and, and to me, the thing that, that really made me go, oh my God, is Christensen returning as Darth Vader. Um, <laughs> I mean, because if you think about like who, who that character was at that time, a newly christened Darth Vader, still almost still probably still scabby still crispy anakin underneath that suit yeah. probably vengeful 
and pissed and furious and heartbroken at Obi-Wan. Right, right. If, if, if that's the direction they take, um, because, you know, we, we never really got to see the emotion of Darth Vader once he became Darth Vader. Like, we got to see Anakin... And then he became Darth, and then he was sort of that very, so, well, you know, somber. In Jedi, you get a little bit of the, you get yeah, the emotion. But, but that's that's that point, yeah, but at that point, yeah. He's almost, but by that point, he's kind of slipping back to sure. Anakin by that. I think I would like to see, like, almost, like furious, pissy, like, I want to kill, you know, I want to find Obi-Wan and kill him. Um, because there's not really, there's, the, there's a line in A New Hope when he senses Obi-Wan on the Death Star, and he says something like, I haven't felt that since, dot, 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 and never completes that sentence. Hmm. So we don't know. When the last time is that they've seen each other? We all thought it was on that on the shore of Mustafar when he was burning. But what if they have seen each other since then? Okay, I got a bunch of questions um, that I don't know if you know the answers to. Yes. A, if he's Darth Vader, why do you need Hayden Christensen? It can literally be anybody. In the uh, suit. Well, he well he did play Darth at the end of Revenge of the Sith. Okay. Um, and uh, and it also per- perhaps. Rise. Uh, Lord I, I don't know. I, I think there's got to be a reason to. Uh, I love that because scene. I've heard Me that they they could potentially do flashbacks to show flashbacks. like Clone Wars stuff, like Obi Wan oh, no. and Hayden Christian uh, before he converts. Uh, second question: Does this mean they have to get James Earl Jones to voice more dialogue? <laughs> if Vader's going to be a character in this series, or are we going to get to the point where James Earl Jones can't voice Darth Vader? Anymore? I I think I would make the argument we've already gotten there. Yeah, um, I felt if like a few years ago, even with Rogue One. Yeah, I mean, granted, to no fault of his own. No, gosh, he is an what? older gentleman. Yeah, he's not going to have the strength and the timber that he had fifty years ago. He's right. just not. Um, I think we will, are probably at the point of finding someone who can do a really good Darth Vader impression. He Darth turns is... ninety in January. Y- yeah, uh, you and can't. I was right. you, you, I was just thinking about this, like, because I, 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 one of my favorite movies he's ever been in was The Sandlot, and I always like he's old in that movie. <laughs> that was like yeah. ninety three or whatever yeah. it was. Like he was old in that film. Yeah. Like the dude yeah. is turning ninety. Yeah. I, I just um, I, I pop onto Cameo every once in a while just to say I'm always curious as to like what celebrities are on Cameo and how much they're charging. Um, and I don't, I don't know, you, I, Sean, you probably didn't, but Kevin, did you ever watch Boy Meets World? Oh yeah. Well, I was a big, like, I love that show, and, and then I saw that, like, Mr. Feeney is on Cameo, and, like, and it had a picture of him from the show, oh, no. and that's my perception oh, no. of, uh, of William Daniels, who I think was, was also, he's been on a bunch of other stuff, but to me it was Mr. Feeney, and it was, like, but then you see videos of him, obviously, he has age, he is an older gentleman, as, as happens with life, and it's just sort of that thing where, like, yeah, that's right. Because he was older when I saw this show twenty years ago, so naturally, yeah, he would be older than it is. It is, but it's a weird feeling, right? You almost kind of like have to check yourself. Oh like, yeah, oh, you cameo, cameo makes like me really sad. Shocked. Cameo makes yeah. me really sad. I've we we've gone down the rabbit hole of cameo. Um, mm-hmm. Once we were doing it for a birthday gift for a friend. Yeah, and the people that are on there. First off, it's like largely uh, C and D level people. Sure, sure. <laughs> And like I watched Debbie Gibson performing some of her songs like at a piano in her lobby yeah. in the in the lobby of her Las Vegas yeah. house. And it's just there's no, it made my heart hurt of just being like, happy birthday. I hear you're a mom of two. And like, Did you guys oh. see the Smokey Robinson one from this week? No. no. Smokey Robinson, who is on Cameo, uh, <laughs> was hired by someone to wish their mom a happy Hanukkah. Okay. And I guess whenever they sent it to him, they spelled it because there are two spellings, one with H and then one with C-H. And I guess Smokey Robinson, poor man, had never seen it spelled with a C-H before. Oh, no. And he goes, I'd like to, uh, your sons would like to, me to wish you a happy Chinooka. And he goes, I have no idea what Chinooka <laughs> is. I think it's made up, but I'm going to go ahead and wish you a happy Chinooka. Oh, and it was just like it like oh, smoky smoky man <laughs> it's just so sad um speaking of age and our aging heroes i know we've had this conversation before but during the disney announcements indiana jones 5 got confirmed and harrison god bless him uh there's conversation that this will be the last one he is currently 78 sure. um i and again looks phenomenal for 78 i'm not saying anything against him but by the time that rolls around, we're going to be seeing he'll be 79 at the time of filming. If, if it starts relatively soon, he could be 80 at the time of filming. If it really gets pushed back. 
is this going to work? Kev, I'm going to ask you, is this going to work? I mean, it's interesting, right? Because he did Force Awakens and he was great in it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, that was what, 2016? I don't know. I mean, like, I... I uh... 80. I don't know, 70, like late 70s. I mean, George Miller directed Dude, Mad we, Max we in 69. Him, I mean, he looked good. Yeah, he looked great. I mean, I feel like there's, I don't know. I feel like that. I, I think there's one more left in him. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I hope I want to see it again. I yeah. mean, we got we got we to wash away that fourth one. I mean, we just I have know. to. I, mean, I like, think that's why I think that's why Ford wants to come back so badly right. and do one more to go out. I don't think I, I think he, either he wishes he could take back Crystal Skull and end with them riding off oh, into the sunset with yes. Last Crusade, which honestly I, I wouldn't mind. Or I think he's really hoping he can bang out one more good one yeah. and have us sort of go, well, maybe four was not great, but we end great on five. Yeah. They're not going to mm. do digital Sean Connery, are they? Like flashback? No, no, because he's, like, they, they addressed that he's dead. And, and, no, I know, but like flashback. Oh, I don't like, think, I don't think so. Do anything I think like that, that, that would be, that that'd would be, be a very bad taste. Yeah. I, uh, I have a quick question about Mandalorian uh, hmm. for two seconds. Um, uh, I, because we were talking about it a, couple, a minute or two ago. Do you guys notice in every week of the show that it basically the basic premise is he has to do a favor for somebody to get to the next point? It's it's and a I video like, game. And it's like every and I feel time. like every week it's like yeah well, I'm here for this but you need to help us with this first. And then we'll, you have to. It's like, a drinking game actually. Yeah. If you take a shot every time they're like we'll help you Mando, yeah. but first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my my buddy Chase uh, po- pointed out something to me and it was like like now I can't unsee it which is. How many different times the Mandalorian puts Baby Yoda in absolute peril just by, like, mm. just wait here and, like, places him in a place and just, like, <laughs> what do you do every week? He leaves him somewhere. Like, like, just hold on to that little child. Just hold on to him. Yeah, yeah. I do dig, I do dig the Grogu <laughs> name. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Grogu. <sighs> it's growing like on it. me. I, oh, yeah. I love it. it I, I kind of agree on you. It, 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 oh, Jamie, you you guys, do you guys buy the... Oh, uh, maybe it's official. I only saw it in like memes. Do you buy the George Lucas tie-in? I do. Yeah, I yeah. kind of do. Oh! The fact yeah, that it's... it's George, Gorgu is yeah. it George Lucas? I, I, oh, kinda he was, I like that. I like that. He was like there the day they shot that scene, yeah. apparently. Yep. Yeah, so... Yeah. yeah. All right, let's move on to a topic that is very close to uh, my heart. Uh, specifically, and Kevin's because he's wearing the sweatshirt today. Uh, Zack Snyder is teasing that his Justice League is the four-hour cut uh, is going to be first R-rated um, for for language and for uh, extensive violence because he says Steppenwolf is just going to be chopping people in half, and that there's at least one moment that he knows of where Batman's going to be dropping an F bomb. Uh, and that he is pushing or at least collaborating (laughs) with uh, (laughs) he's collaborating with HBO Max uh, which is something that I've speculated on which is now that they have a deal in place for stuff that's going to HBO Max is also going to theaters why wouldn't the Justice League be going to theaters and he is saying that he would like it to to come to theaters as well too and that he's been playing around with restoring aspect ratios he's been talking about restoring aspect ratios to BVS so that there's a rumor that he might do like a man of steel into BVS into the justice league a theatrical a marathon type thing uh, i think this is phenomenal what i would like to see him do uh, if this is actually going to be the plan is to wait until all four episodes are out uh, give people the chance to see the story if they want to i don't know if i want i would want to well, I guess I, I would. I, I guess I wouldn't mind if the episodes, as they dropped, since it's a four-part series, if the episodes also dropped in theaters at the time. I don't think theaters would say no to this uh, opportunity. I think they would s- snatch up anything to lure people into the theaters. So yeah, now that I'm saying it out loud, I guess my first chance to see the new episodes, if they give me the option to see it in a theater. Uh, I absolutely would go to see it in a theater. It seems like um, he's designing these to be seen in, in a theater. And to me right now, that sounds like uh, the best news possible. So all four hours will be black and white, right? And then they'll all have the uh, bars in the left and right. So it'd be like a one, three, three or four, three ratio. Essentially. They're not black and white. Um, he's released white. some material in black and white, but they're fully colored. No, everything Wasn't is Wasn't the trailer in black and white? Mm-mm. They... Ha- when they released the initial trailer at DC Fandom, it was normal color. Then hmm. he released a black and white version when they had to take the music out of it because they oh, got copyright okay. dinged for Hallelujah. I think just because they couldn't use it for a very long period of time. Um, and now they are back using it. So. There's cool. no way it's actually letterboxed or, or there's no way it's actually square, right? <laughs> I think it is. No, I don't think I don't think they're going to let that. him do that. I don't know. 
I really don't know. It's the same thing we talk about with with make. We're like, if someone, it's not as drastic, but like, if you decide to make a movie in black and white, you are making the decision to cut out a huge chunk of the audience who's just gonna dismiss it. And I think that if someone turns on their TV and it's square, right? I don't know. It's a superhero, so I guess maybe they're already sold. But Ironically, just, like the same way my parents, like if they ever accidentally rented a widescreen VHS, they're yeah. like, "What are these bars on the top and bottom?" I don't see. Yeah, I don't see people at home with like their sixty-inch TVs that are only like a third of them is being used. Right. Being Honestly, really I I agree with experience. that, and I I get why it would be that way. I understand it, but that would really annoy me if I'm watching yeah. a square for four Have you guys IMDb, ever hit... IMDb saying it's, it's one, three, three to one. That's the official ratio. That is, that is a square box. And then, but it does say it's in color. Have you ever hit well, the, the... You said the... IMDb said that? Oh. Yeah. Have you... But I think that's all based on that trailer. Yeah. Have you ever hit I, the IMDb ratio button on your remote control by accident and it, like, warps your image to fit something different? Like... If you watch everything in standard or theatrical, am I the only one that's ever done this? I seem to do it all the time. I hit I hit a button and it either stretches wide and everything looks so weird and so distorted that I can't can't rebound and come I, back. I don't think I have like the button on my remote. I think I have to like go into the I don't I, don't, I can't easily accidentally do uh, it. I think I gotcha, have to go gotcha. into the menu to actually do it. Um so I'm hearing March uh for this and I don't Wait, know Wait, isn't there something else with the Snyder Cut coming out in March as well? Well, yeah, Jake, that's very funny that you mentioned that. Uh my release of Snyder Cut book has been moved back from February 15th to March 1st. So I hope that the movie comes out March 11th. That would be ideal for the book to come out <laughs> right before the movie releases. Yeah. Uh how, how do you guys feel about the episodic nature of it? If it if they keep to episodes, would you want to go back once a week to the theaters to see him? Jake, you wouldn't even be able to. Uh, no, I would. I would want to watch them, right, right in the old Hamilton cinemas, all at once. How about a four-hour cut? Kev, you down for I, a four-hour cut? Oh, I'd watch a four-hour cut in theaters. Would you yeah. really? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd rather watch a four-hour cut in theaters than go back four times in theaters. If it's four hours, can we get an intermission? I'm assuming that they would. Sure. Okay. Yeah. He'll he'll four make a Snyder cut. He'll make a Snyder they cut didn't... right in the middle. Yeah. How long was uh? How long? <laughs> how long was uh? The Irishman. Seven three hours and, and thirty-seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> three and a half. No, it was three and a half, yeah. wasn't it? It yeah. was all. It was. I was. I was. I was along for the ride, but I also wouldn't have minded an intermission. Yeah. I mean, I guess the 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 long story short is that it's uh, if it's good, no one will care, right? If or you're invested, else, sure. I would have minded some better CG on their faces too. Yeah, uh, Kev. I know you're psyched about the R rating. You have to be psyched about the R rating. Oh no, question, dude. The BVS R rated cut is unbelievable. I was rewatching it this weekend, um, and just like the blood squirting out, like and like just like the there was the the warehouse scene, and like oh. I, I remember interviewing Snyder for BVS for BVS, and actually talking to him about what the R rated cut was going to entail, and then and what he said in that interview was exactly what it ended up being when they released that cut. I'll never forget, like. That warehouse scene in R-rated is amazing, and I can't wait to see how they do it. So, Dude, tell the story about um, Saturday when I texted you. Oh, yeah. This is the strangest coincidence ever, and this keeps happening to me. So Lauren and I, were we, we, got, our, we got a new TV recently because our old TV had some pixel issues, so we were testing like some 4Ks out to see how it looked on the, uh, on the TV. And one of the 4Ks I popped in was Justice or uh, uh, Batman vs. Superman Ultimate Edition. And about... I don't know, like 30, 40 minutes into it, I'm at scenes where I remember being in full IMAX. I saw it in, in LA in, in 70 millimeter IMAX. And I just remember like the opening with Batman, uh, the uh, young Batman, that's all IMAX. Like the entire Batman oh. versus Superman fight is all IMAX. The entire, I mean, it's insane. The nightmare scene is all IMAX. Um, and so I was looking at my uh, uh, my Blu-ray and I'm like, it's not expanding. And I was like, yeah, I remember this not expanding uh, when it first came out. And I'm like, why did Snyder... And this is also under the Nolan umbrella because Nolan puts his movies out on, on Blu-ray through Warner Brothers and it all has the as IMAX uh, aspect ratio shifts. There's, they're not on this. And I, and I looked at Lauren and I literally said out loud, why doesn't this movie have the IMAX ratio shifts on it? 30 minutes later, Sean texts me <laughs> an image that Snyder's confirming that they're, that they're going to be reissuing the film with the IMAX ratio shifts. And yep. it happened literally within the time frame of when I asked Lauren that question. It was the strangest like coincidence ever. I heard you exactly. ask it. A single, a single tear rolled yeah. down Kevin's cheek. I, well, cause like, <laughs> I'll tell you right, I mean, this is so, this sounds so like, uh, um, I guess elitist or whatever, whatever the word would be, but like, I just, I just so used to the way Nolan presents his Blu-rays that any film shot in that format I, I, like Ghost Protocol is one that really upsets me. Like Ghost Protocol, which is Mission Impossible, Brad Bird, 
shot the Burj Khalif scene on IMAX film, 65 millimeter IMAX film. I saw that on an eight story screen in New York City when he was when he was on that outside that building. The Blu-ray does not shift. And I don't understand how that's not being done. Nolan gets it done. So first man got it done with Damien Chazelle. So it sounds like Snyder's retconning that now, which I, I it needs to be done because the IMAX photography in BVS is stunning. Like the opening is stunning. The, the, even the funeral, the Superman funeral scenes in IMAX. It's yeah. unbelievable. So when you see dirt, tweets that oh. show how much more picture is shown Huge. it's it's really eye-opening i mean it's, i understand it, it, why you argue for it all the time it is an astounding astounding difference when you see the imax for when i put on voodoo today for tenet it didn't have the imax it cut off like so much of the image and i couldn't believe it but that's the way the nature of streaming is so. that's why you guys need a new tv because you threw your remote through the screen Lord goes god kevin not again god, yeah you want to get the full 178 man that full that full ratio is the best the mccarthy backyard is just littered with broken television sets <laughs> <laughs> constantly tossing them out uh this week in movies have you guys either of you seen paul ws anderson's uh monster hunter no, no? Uh, but I, I i i, I yeah. always wondered if paul ws anderson and paul thomas anderson ever, ever been in the same room though that's one thing I, that's, those are questions that i think about all the time and i wonder if they've ever exchanged like do you think paul ws anderson's like Hey, Paul T. Anderson, did you see Resident Evil 7? And he's like, no, did you see Phantom Thread? <laughs> and he says, no. Here's a question. Has anyone ever seen the two of them together? How do we know they're not the same person? Uh, what? A... Where does where does Wes Anderson fit in all of this? <laughs> oh, there's so many Andersons. <laughs> That's what the so WS many. stands for, I thought. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. He's like, when I don't want to be so twee about everything, I really... I... I had the I had the period. Like Monster this Paul, Paul W S Anderson has to understand that he's I wouldn't want to say lesser of the P, Paul Anderson. No, you can say lesser. <laughs> but you can say lesser. I will say Paul Poor W S guy. Anderson directed Event Horizon, and that movie's freaking awesome. He's like, made he's, he's made, he's some, made some good stuff, and I, yeah. I, I and I I'd say that jokingly because he, but after the tenth Resident Evil, I just was like, dude, I mean, come on, let's just let's, I, so I give him credit though. Those are uniquely his movies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dude, and they they oh, employ yeah. both him and his wife. There, yes. there are, <laughs> true, yeah. There's a kill in the first one that's it, still... He's married to Milo, right? Yeah. Isn't he yeah. married to Milo Jovovich? I yeah. believe so, yeah. There's still... I, I will say, though, when you think about cinematic imagery, one of the images that comes to mind is from the first Resident Evil, when that guy the lasers. gets just the cut in, into yeah. cubes of, like, cheese yeah. slices. I like the first one, because I love those video games. I like yeah. the Resident Evil games. And I mean, not the, to, uh, yeah. Event uh, Horizon, not, yeah. See that? Yeah, no, Kev, we're running a story on Cinema Blend. This afternoon, Mike Reyes is because Mike Reyes interviewed I love um, Mike Reyes. Paul and Mila for uh, for this movie for Monster Hunter. And but he asked him Ugh. about his director's cut of Event Horizon. And uh, uh, Paul, Paul W.S. Anderson told him that the Snyder cut story has inspired him to want to oh. go back and restore the longer version of Event Horizon because he said, get this. Oh, that's cool. There's a salt mine in like Transylvania, like the actual Transylvania. Um, where he put prints of the movie to maintain them. It's almost like when we were talking to Tony um, Cerrone, uh, Tony yeah. Cervo Cervoni, Cervoni. Uh, and talked about that salt mine that's in the middle of, uh, the was it Missouri or Kansas? Yeah. Um, so that exists in Europe as well, too. And that's where the Event Horizon reels are. And Paul W.S. Anderson wants to unearth them and, and put them back into Event Horizon. Dude, Event Horizon, I will never forget seeing that with my parents. And there's that image that still haunts me of that guy on the ceiling and his body is just completely open yeah. and he's just hanging there. Yeah. And then I, all I can see is Sam Neill and his wife like like haunting. Like that, that movie is so terrifying it's like one of the scariest movies i've ever seen it i've never revisited it I, i've actually been too afraid to it's just so brutal but great movie though have either of you seen Fat fatal fatal no. i'm watching it tomorrow night actually i had uh there's yeah yeah who's in it hey they, they was it michael ely and hillary hillary swank yeah. and then uh mike coulter from luke cage oh yeah has hillary yeah, swank yeah. been in like eight movies this year feels like she's always got yeah, a movie she, out. she hasn't been away a lot she, well, she will be soon because that show got canceled. Her agent is on uh, the hunt for new projects. For Oscar number three? <laughs> yes, exactly. She's looking for that next million yeah. dollar baby. <laughs> All right. Every, Let's get to Mario. Every, every time I make fun bottom. of her, she can give us the finger with two Oscars. 
Yeah, yes. and by the way, there's no making fun of it. We actually, Hillary Swank's amazing, and she was actually a great interview for a way. A way was actually yeah, a, good it, sh- a really I'm good show. They, yeah. I was going to do the Fatal Junket uh, tomorrow, and they pushed it to Thursday, and I can't do it Thursday, so I'm bummed yeah. that uh, I have to miss out. I want to give you guys time to rave about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Um, I did not get oh. a chance to finish it, um, so I'm not going to really chime in, because I think Michelle and I only made about 30 minutes through, and then we just haven't gone back to it. Not for any uh, quality of film. We started it late on a thursday night or something like that and then but after about 30 minutes we were just like can we pause it and then uh everything's got so busy we didn't get back to it but it's this uh chadwick boseman's final performance uh he's starring opposite uh viola davis in a in a adaptation of what i did not realize is a stage play but it's one of those things where you very very quickly understand that it the dialogue is delivered uh very much like a stage play it's it's set primarily in a music studio where a uh, viola davis's character is coming in to record uh, Chad Bozeman's one of the session musicians um, who dreams of bigger things, from what I can tell. Uh, he has hot, bigger aspirations of where he'd like to go with his music. The other guys in the session musicians are very much play it by the play it by the page. And so, um, Kev, you I remember when you first saw it, you really raved about it and particularly about Chadwick. So where are you at with it? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's an outstanding film. I mean, I, I, I it's it's was it 95 minutes. It, it's very quick, um, but it's also extremely uh, dense in the, in the in the in a good way, if I, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. It, it, it's layered, but short, if that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, it's I, I, I think about this a lot and I have no basis for um, a, a knowing if I'm right or wrong about this. But I, I just think a lot about Chadwick Boseman and, and the choices that he made as an actor to leave certain films behind right Mm -hmm. like to uh to uh have a legacy that's going to teach and 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 put an imprint on people when they watch it and i just think about these projects because again we didn't know he was past we didn't know he was dealing with cancer and Mm -hmm. and then he passed away and now we examine his work and you start wondering what choices were made and i and i can't help but think that this performance uh, in his mind just from my perspective he was like you know what i'm going to give everything i have right here Hmm. and and i think he's always given everything he has but i i I would argue that there was something in his mind that he knew this was one of his last or one of the and and, you know this is the last film he did um again this is just speculation just based on how i feel about him as an actor and the roles he did prior to his passing i mean think about it black panther to five bloods i mean everything he did had some massive importance to it right Mm -hmm. um and i i I was watching the film you know immersed in it and i wasn't thinking about this specifically until it ended but after the film ended i couldn't help but look at him and go dude literally went 150 percent in this performance it Mm -hmm. is it is it's astounding like like it, it is it's musical it's it's emotional his arc is so uh, i can't i won't say the word there's a word i want to use but i won't use it because it'll spoil it but his arc is just very it's a gut punch there's something mm-hmm. very um emotional emotional and immersive about what his character goes through in this 90 minutes uh and i just think everything about the performance like, like to a point where he's so famous and he just passed away, so he's on your mind. You know who Chadwick Boseman is, sure. But I didn't think it was him the whole time. Like that's how good he is in that in that film. Like he he becomes this character, and his story. And I don't know if Jake would agree. I, I love everybody in the movie. Viola Davis is fantastic. Everybody's amazing. But his story is to me the heart of the film. And I, mm. I, I don't know if Jake would agree, but there's something about that character's past that is weaved into his narrative. That is then structured as part of the story. I I argue that it's more his story than Ma Rainey's, even though it's called Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, uh, only because of the the um, what happens with this character and also the 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 moments that he leaves behind on screen. They they left me with chills. His entire arc left me with chills. Um, so I I think that everybody in this film is incredible, but his performance I think is one of the best I've ever seen. And I and I and I genuinely think that he it has nothing to do with his passing. It's just purely it a phenomenal performance but it's hard not to think about the fact that he made that choice to that to, for that to be his last film mm-hmm. so that's where uh, i'm at i i actually is, is it, great I, I love chadwick boseman in the film but for me viola davis is the mvp because for me she just completely disappears in that role um i uh you know and to the point where i know it wasn't that long ago that we did viola davis blend if we were to redo it I might choose this. Like, that's just how good she is in this. Uh, I'm now also... 
kind of low-key excited for this like new series of films that's apparently unfurling because this is a part of like August Wilson's like decades series mm -hmm. where he wrote plays based on every like like the the African American experience in America in different decades. So this is I guess is the second one. Fences being the first. Mm -hmm. So they're all going to be produced by Denzel Washington. Um, and and so right now I'd say they're not only two for two but like two pretty big home runs in a row. That's pretty amazing. Um, I didn't know and, that. That's cool. Yeah. And uh, and so I, I I think Fences is the 40s, and I want to say Kevin, this is the third. This is the thir 30s, 19, uh, 1930s in oh, Chicago. Oh, they take place in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the 30s. I think Fences is the 40s. Not sure which one they're going to do next. Um, but Kevin's right. Short amount of time, but packs a lot in. Um, a really, really, really interesting um, sort of microcosm of uh, the exploitation of, of African American artists by white people at that time. Um, and also something that like, even though it's taking place in 1930s Chicago, you really wouldn't have to change that much to the story or to the script mm. to have it take place in 2020 Chicago. Like, you know, there's so you know, there's a lot of different elements. And I think those are always the most interesting stories, stories that take place a hundred years ago, but all you really got to do is swap out the cars, the technology and a few key words, and you can tell the exact same story in a completely different time period. Right. Um, and I think it's really well done. I'm always hit and miss on uh, play adaptations to the screen. Sometimes I, it just makes me think, well, I would just rather see this like on the stage. Sure. And then sometimes you look at something like Doubt or something like Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and you almost feel like you're watching. Like, like it's so real and visceral that you almost feel like you can reach out and touch the people on the on the screen. Uh, I, this is this is low key one of my one of my favorite movies so far this year. I, I always feel weird saying favorite movies so far this year this time of year because then if you don't put it on your top ten list, people are like, wait a second, yeah. you, you you didn't put it on, like <clears throat> as if you can't have like a, like just a, just a, a reminder for people. It is possible to love more than ten movies in a year. Um, but so I so I'm always hesitant whenever I say like, oh, it's one of my favorite movies so far this year in December because then people get pissy if you don't put it on your top ten. Well, look for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom on Netflix. Was it hitting on the 18th? Is that when it's? Yeah, this, Friday. This, this Friday, yeah, this and it's, Friday. it's 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 an incredible film. It really yeah. it really is, and oh. uh, I mean, and Viola Davis is fantastic as well. I, I just uh, I just felt like it was Chadwick's film. I don't yeah. for me personally. But. All right, let's get to the blend game. Uh, Gabe came up with a really cool concept where he's doing, uh, or we're all doing, original release blend, and the the idea behind this because um, we ended up getting really great uh, people participating with really clever ideas. Original release blend means if you could go back in time and and live through the opening weekend and experience uh, a film be, without any of the baggage or, 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 you know, any of the stuff that comes with seeing it later, um, just being able to go into the theater on opening weekend and see it, uh, what film would you choose? Uh, I'm going to go first and I'm going to say that I had to go with a filmmaker who uh, makes blockbusters to entertain mainstream audiences Potentially, according to Real Blend, the greatest director of all time, uh, I had to pick Spielberg. And for Spielberg in particular, I had to choose Jaws. Because I just think that uh, Jaws, the way that it snuck up on the audience uh, and surprised them uh, with, they had no clue what to expect, with the amount of surprises and shocks that are in Jaws, with being able to connect with those characters for the very first time, and not really knowing, like, I can't even think back to... Um, a moment in Jaws where I didn't know who would survive or not, but I can at least remember seeing it early on uh, and and being afraid for the safety of the three main guys by the time they finally went out to, uh, because by that point, the movie had basically shown you that nobody was safe, that it was willing to uh, get rid of the a kid, that it was willing to take down a girl in the opening scene, that, you know, you always felt like if anybody was in the water, that they truly were in danger. And I still think that the um, the use of the shark is so visceral and, and gets those scares out of it, but I, I can't imagine what it was like the opening weekend with an audience who was seeing that for the very first time the you know why don't you come down here and chum some of this shit kind of thing with with bruce sticking his head up and and just the terror that comes with that like that that has to be the ultimate goose the audience moment and uh i just think that the final 15 20 minutes of jaws or you know you think of like dreyfus getting in the cage and going into oh. the water and just all of the uh even the even the 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 quote-unquote cheap scares 
of you know the the head that comes into the the hole and scares Dreyfus. Like you can almost telegraph that. You know that that's coming. But Jaws has so many authentic. I don't expect these things to really scare me kind of thing. And I would assume that opening weekend, and of course, you know, it's the birth of the modern blockbuster. Uh, theaters ended up becoming packed, packed, packed. But I think it would be really fun to go back to that weekend, experience it, uh, you know, even going into it to see what is Jaws? What is, wh- who is this Spielberg kid, you know, who's had a couple of uh, uh, films before, but hasn't really broken through. And just to see a, a movie grip an audience like that, that's a, uh, that's what I chose. I just, so. I just picture like if, if film Twitter existed at that time, film Ugh. Twitter would just be so obnoxious. He'd be like, oh, he ju- he's just doing Duel again. <laughs> it's Duel with a shark. Uh, I think I know both of your answers. And so um, I would like to guess. Can I guess? Sure. Mm-hmm. Jake, I think you chose Empire Strikes Back. Very close. Oh, all right. Go ahead. Uh, I chose the original Star Wars. Okay, fair enough. Um, Not, not... A New Hope, not Episode Four. Yeah, just a film called Star Wars. Okay. Um, I would, you know, I I've never lived a life basically without knowing what Star Wars was. Even before my dad introduced it to me, I was still aware of what it was like in the realm of pop culture. Like I knew what a, I knew what Yoda was. I knew what Luke Luke Skywalker. I knew Darth Vader was. I can't imagine having no preconceived notion of of what that that story is Mm. and you're sitting in a theater and you've heard a couple of things about it and you see in silence a long time ago in a galaxy far far away and then john williams music star wars flies back you got the scroll but from the scroll you got the spaceship coming overhead that that is just that opening scene alone yeah i i can't imagine and, and, and for me, I, the thing is, I actually almost chose Jaws, but I think the reason I went with Star Wars is just because of its significance to me personally. Mm. And, and, but but as, as significant as it is, I'll never get to have that mm. moment. I'll never get to experience it like that. One of my favorite uh, Lucas quotes is one of his few regrets for creating Star Wars is that he never got to watch Star Wars. <laughs> he never got to sit in a theater yeah. and be wowed by... The rebel ship coming overhead, and then, the, and then the imperial, you know, star destroyer coming overhead, and uh, so yeah, I, I I understand what he means. Like I, like I've seen that scene, I, I from start to finish, I literally I watched it the other day. From start to finish, I've probably seen it uh, triple digits. And I always think sometimes people are exaggerating when they talk about how many times. Not Kevin, but I think most people are exaggerating <laughs> by, about how many times I've seen a movie. Yeah. I, I've probably seen it right at probably a little bit over a hundred times, um, but I've never seen it like that. Right. And I really wish I could. I wish I could see it blindly. Kevin, I think you chose Psycho. That is correct. Yeah, I got one. Yeah, that is 100. percent You got okay. You were pretty close on mine. Yeah. Yeah. You you got both of them. I would yeah. say you got yeah. both of them. Yeah. Um. For so for me, uh, I, I don't get angry about a lot of things, but one thing that genuinely grinds my gears, as uh, Peter Griffin says on Family Guy, <laughs> just um, that. is uh, is are people showing up to a theater, 15, 20 oh, minutes oh. into a movie. So much so that I, I I get I get personally offended by that. <laughs> um, like like if I if I'm sitting in a movie theater and someone walks in 20 minutes into the into the movie, I, I it actually ruins my experience because I feel bad that they had just missed all that setup. I feel, I've seen people walk in and I saw people walk in 20 minutes into Tenant when I saw Tenant. Like how could you miss that opening scene in the yeah, opera? Yeah, yeah. Like Kevin just started screaming at them. I, mean, I literally, <laughs> I had to hold myself back from saying, "Can you please get out of here and come back to the next showing? What are you okay, doing?" Okay, but wait, hold on. Let me go because every once in a while now, if I'm coming out of a movie theater and a screen is playing something that I love, especially like when Endgame was playing or Infinity That's War, different. I jumped in and would just watch it from wherever I was. So it, That's I could different. have angered you. What if that person it's had almost seen as frustrating Tenebrae. as someone walking in the end of Star Wars Episode Nine and just completely ruining that film right, for them? Right, right. But it, but in all honesty, like, yeah, it's a great story. Um, <laughs> now, I, so the reason why I chose Psycho is, and this is a really famous story, and I actually found the poster for, it, which makes me really excited. Oh, cool. So. So, so when Hitchcock put out Psycho, he had a mandate. Like, it's kind of like it's cool. Like, Hitchcock used to really control the a lot of the promotion of his movies and kind of how that happened. So with Psycho, he had so much power. 
Right. He had a mandate. And I'm going to read I'm going to read the poster. This is an actual poster. It says it is required that you see Psycho from the very beginning. The next showing of Psycho begins at and then it would have a block of what time the showing was. The manager of this theater has been instructed at the risk of his life not to admit to the theater any persons after the picture starts. Uh, Any spurious attempts to enter by side doors fire escapes or ventilating shafts will be met by force. (laughs) The entire objective of this uh, extraordinary policy, of course, is to help you enjoy Psycho more. Alfred Hitchcock. And, you know, I I, 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 that to me is such worth a... pointing out I, for people who maybe have listened to Alfred Hitchcock words for the first time. He's a yeah. very tongue in cheek, funny guy. And that is a perfect tone of, yeah. of right. how he would set the scene. Right. And that's a poster I was looking at just online. So, but the reason why I picked that is because I would love to have been in those lines outside, oh. not knowing what I was about to experience. And you have to understand, like, if you take yourself out of knowing what Psycho is and you see that Janet Lee scene for the first time without any yeah. setup, the, the person any... who you think is the star of the entire film, yep. right, killed off in the first 20, 20, 25 minutes. And it is a very brutal scene. Um, it's incredibly well edited. But to have been in that theater of people expecting that character to continue on for the two hours or whatever the time frame of the film would be, for that death to happen that quickly. And then for everybody in that theater to collectively go, what are we about to experience? Yeah. And I think with Psycho, you know, I think I, I, you know, much like classic twists, like Usual Suspects or whatever, a lot of those things were ruined for me before I saw them. You know, obviously, you know, Luke's uh, father being Vader and like all that stuff, all those things were ruined for me. I, they were part of culture. Like like Janet Lee's death in Psycho is pop culture now. It is, sure. they, it's, it's iconic so much so that Jamie Lee Curtis recreated it. Uh, herself for Instagram for like an anniversary. Um, So for me, I always found that it was cool that even at that point in film history, there was a filmmaker who was so in tune with this idea that you have to be there from the start and you can't just walk in. Could you imagine walking into Psycho 25 minutes in and then miss that scene? Where the hell is Janet Lee? Right. And so like, you know, (laughs) like, and I, so to me, it was cool that a filmmaker had that power um, in order to try that. But also, you, what I love about that story is that it showed you how passionate Hitchcock was about the theatrical experience and you having the best experience possible. Um, and for me, I, you know, it just, it just really grinds my gears. Like I said, like when, when someone walks into a theater 20 minutes in, I, really, I want to go over to them and say, please don't, you're, you're, you're ruining this for yourself. You're also making me angry, but you're ruining this for yourself. Um, so that's the experience I would love to have had. I would love to have been in one of those sold out lines outside with a random stranger. And like, you know, we're getting ready to see the new Hitchcock film. We have no idea what's about to happen. There's no Twitter spoilers. There's no Facebook spoilers. I'm not, and it hasn't been ruined. Um, You know, like News of the World was, uh, there's a movie coming out called News of the World. I mean, we have Greengrass on the show this week. Um, And there's an interesting element uh, in the story that, you know, as Tom Hanks goes around and and reads the news to people who don't know the news of the world, people who work all day long and don't have that ability. And I sat there and looked at myself and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, could you imagine not knowing every minute what is happening in the world? I think we would live better lives. Oh, to yeah. be honest with you, I think we're, we're so connected that it's... To be and, fair, and, I get on Facebook and most people on Facebook don't know what's going on in the world. Right. Either. But, our, but the news cycle is so fast now that we don't even emotionally connect to anything anymore. It's just like, right. it's just boom, 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 boom. And so it was just an interesting uh, uh, revelation of like the times. And I, and, and I kind of like, I would imagine that the psycho times, just like the Jaws times or the Star Wars times that you guys brought up mm-hmm. were special things that weren't ruined, that were collective communal experiences that you got to have with total strangers and you're all universally feeling the same thing, essentially. We can still um, so chase that, those me, at film festivals. A lot of times you yeah. find something at a film festival that people haven't seen yet. But even the ones that come yeah. with advanced buzz have a little yeah. bit of it taken away from them. I Like one recent yeah. one for me was at South By when we saw Cabin in the Woods. And <laughs> nobody <laughs> knew what Cabin in the Woods was yet. Yeah. We just knew it was Joss Whedon. Nobody knew Drew Goddard yet at that point. Yeah. And I can remember being in the Paramount Theater, uh, the main venue at, in Austin uh, for Cabin in the Woods, and just it just played the audience like a fiddle, and it was amazing. Yeah, like I, I mean, I remember like, and again, not to I know we have to wrap up, but like films like the mate, like like we've had, and I, this might be another uh, discussion we could have at some other point in the show. What films have had that? 
cultural impact mm. in our lifetime. So, like, you know, you could argue, I would argue, The Matrix or Jurassic Park, films that were were so monumentally game changing that if you got to experience The Matrix in a theater for the first time without knowing what it was, mm. it was. I'll never forget. I walked into the kind wrong. Of what this discussion is? Yeah. This what? <laughs> yeah, kind of. But it's no, kind, but, kind but, of but no, I'm, I'm on the opposite end. I'm like the ones that we did get to have. That you got to um, see. And so, like, for me, I'll never forget, and again, much like the Hitchcock story I told, I'll never forget going to an AMC, I think I've told this before, to see Matrix with my, my dad and I, my uncle. And I walked into Theater 12 by a mistake instead of Theater 11. And when I walked in, it was the helicopter sequence where the helicopter's going down. And this usher came and grabbed me, not that he was mad that I walked in the theater. He was like, dude, you're going to ruin the movie for yourself. You walked into the wrong theater because he actually cared. That's, that's awesome. Great. I love about that. About yeah. my like ruining of the moment. And like, I just don't know if we have that today. Like, it, it, it's just so different. Film, we film make it back to that now, different. though. The way that movies yeah. are going to have to go back to theaters, you make Dark it back Knight. to them being an event. You know, I hope mm -hmm. they end up becoming an event. Like By the way, were. Dark Knight just got uh, in, uh, inducted into the Library of Congress this week. I wanted to give a yeah, shout out to that. That's Huge crazy. deal. And Shrek. Yeah. Did Shrek get in? Yeah, the first one. Oh, yeah, Shrek, I think yeah, so. Shrek, Blues I'm Brothers, cool Greece. Yeah. Brendan is so obsessed with Shrek, more as like a <laughs> meme, um, that every time we leave our laptops open around the house, he put he opens up a window and puts like some type of Shrek meme, um, and it's annoying. <laughs> but I again admire his consistency. <laughs> that, yeah, man, you gotta and, admire that consistency, that conviction. I'm away from my computer and I come back to it. I'm waiting. I have Shrek waiting for me on my computer. All right, audience <laughs> picks. Uh, Jake Skelly chose Jurassic Park. Really good choice. Karen Schumacher, uh, Damian McDonald, and many others went with Jaws. Uh, Andy Christina said The Godfather. <laughs> Leonard Wilson said Seven. Ryan Jones and many others showing love for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yes, another really good one, I would imagine. Yeah, that would have been a great cool. opening weekend. Uh, for next week, based off of uh, where we are going with Wonder Woman, this is going to be very, very challenging. Please play along with hashtag Chris Pine. Bl Actually, for two weeks, uh, we're going to play hashtag Chris Pine Blend. So let us know your pick via email at realblend.com. You can play along on social media using hashtag Chris Pine Blend. Um, and when you are sending us your pick, you can also leave us a review because we do not have one for this week. So go to uh, Why Apple don't you love us? Podcasts. It helps us grow the show. And we also will review uh, your review on air. Gabe, can you please update the audience on the Hollywood schedule? Uh, the uh, holiday schedule? Not the Hollywood schedule. The holiday schedule for our for our Hollywood updates. Gabe, what are we going to be doing for the next couple weeks? Uh, yes, so for those of you that were here for the Thanksgiving week, we're having a similar uh, schedule for Christmas, which is next week. Next week. Yeah. yeah. Um, Goodness. We are taking next week off. Uh, you for premium subscribers, you will still get a premium episode that week and the next. Um, but we will be back the last week of the year, answering the Chris Pine question, mm. the Chris Pine blend, um, and giving our top fives of twenty twenty. Five, five, yeah. We always do five? top five, top ten. That's thirty movies. We got to about thirty different movies. That's a lot. We spent eighteen minutes on on cheeseburgers. <laughs> That's and normal, I assume though. they're going to come up again in a couple weeks. <laughs> that's kind of normal. You know what? I kind of, I like that we're doing five. Um, I think that's a little bit stronger. I could be wrong, but I think we've done five for the last three years. Hmm. That's a good question. I think I we, like haven't we always done like rapid fire 10 through six and then discuss Can five? we do that? Can we list our 10 through six? We'll, we'll talk about Before we pop into five. I'd like to do we'll that talk if we could. Yeah. That's fine. I yeah, legitimately yeah. Just, put, I started to put together a list this week and I only have about seven movies. I have my, my list. I, my list is pretty has, hasn't changed except for one movie that I need. Well, to, tune in. Tune in in a couple weeks. I feel like I I'm gonna take a big more. swing with my number one. What? Oh, I'm curious what it's gonna be. Hold on. Never mind. I'll think about it next week. All right. So anyway, uh, you can follow us online at Jake's Takes at Kevin McCarthy TV at Sean underscore O'Connell. Follow the show at Real Blend. And until next week. Hubie! Oh, Hubie! this is going to be our number one movie of the year. Hubie! How Hubie! We? we have to stop. We have to stop. <laughs> no, we don't. When Hubie. we get the director of Hubie Halloween on the show. I'm busy that day. <laughs>